are with the, another episode of the Warrior Poet Project podcast with a special guest, Miss Amber Lyon, who I've just enjoyed a fabulous lunch with. We've been chatting and uh, glad to have you on the podcast here. Thank you so much for having me on. It's, it's a real honor. I, I love your work. Uh, I love the show and I, I love what you stand for. Oh, thank you. Ben. I really appreciate that. So for the people who most of my listeners, of course, will know a lot of your story, but for the people who haven't, you know, you came and have a really interesting story. Started off at CNN, and then you discovered some things that (laughs) you took a small offense to and then kind of brought that to light. So tell us a little bit about that path, and then, of course, we'll get to where you've gone since then. Yeah, I mean, my life has been turned right side up in a nutshell, (laughs) pretty dramatically over the past year. Um, But I, I think my path to awakening really was working for CNN. I'd come in there with values of using journalism to change the world and improve the country. And from the inside, I discovered that uh, they weren't ethically performing journalism. Uh, One of my documentaries was censored, and I believe that's because the government that we were exposing with this documentary was also paying the network to run positive programming Mm -hmm. about this government, which is the opposite of investigative journalism. And so that was a really big upset for me. And so... I think a lot of people that know my work know that I was very public uh, about that. Yeah. Because I felt like the public needed to know. Of course. I mean, that... it was it was shocking to hear for a lot of us, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. you hear you have this impression that oh, media is, you know, getting manipulated, but then to actually know that a government was paying one of what seemed to be one of the most respected news organizations out there for putting out a spin on a story or, you know, changing the way things go. It's pretty surprising, pretty shocking. And it wasn't just the government of Bahrain, which was the government we were exposing. It was uh, several governments, uh, pro-U.S. governments, were were paying the network to create these documentaries that really made the countries and the leaders look like they were reformers and and they were Uh respecting human rights, which was the stark opposite of what we were actually Ex- uh, experiencing on the ground in Bahrain. And the thing that interests me is, I- I've always been curious, and this question I have for you is, you see something like that, and you would think that would be the death knell. People would be like, oh, shit, game's over, done, you know, we're, we're through with mainstream media, forget about it, it's been exposed. And, or something even like watching Blackfish, like the documentary about SeaWorld. I watched that, I'm like, SeaWorld's done, it's over. Game over, but yeah. then nonetheless, there's still people tuning in, showing up and watching CNN. There's still people going to Sea World, and and you know, is it kind of frustrating or interesting? What what are your thoughts about how people can kind of just say, meh, okay, and then still kind of carry on when these things are exposed like that? I think for some people, it's just comfort level. They don't want to have to face the reality of things that are happening in this country that we may have falsely been led into wars. Um, It's just too much negative tension. It causes them too much anxiety. So I think they don't want to hear that message. They don't want to hear the message that, oh my goodness, since I was young, maybe for the past 30 years, I've been misled by this mainstream news and I've I've really fallen for it. And and so I think that's hard for a lot of people to grasp. I think other people just have their blinders up. Mm -hmm. They're just not paying attention and they don't really care. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, someone once told me that people move from inspiration and desperation. And if you're somewhere in the middle of both of those, you're really not going to take action. And I think, you know, you see a combination of both of those in different movements. But I think for Americans, generally, we're a bit too comfortable. You know, things are okay. We're not desperate, you know, and not enough people have that fire of inspiration to really go out there and make dramatic change, but I think there are some encouraging signs, awareness slowly spreading, spreading. Um, but it's, it's always interesting to me how, you know, something like this can happen that you think would just change the landscape overnight and then it just kind of moves on. Maybe, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and also maybe I just didn't do a good enough job. <laughs> you did a great job. Explaining it, you know, I, I took a lot of risks. It was a lot of, uh, personal, um, struggle to decide to come forward because I knew not only was I putting my safety at risk, but uh, just many, on many levels I was going against the system. And uh, at the end of the day, I, I realized how many people, how powerful the mainstream media is in misleading the American public. And I just felt a duty. I couldn't sleep anymore knowing what I knew. I knew I had to expose this. And, uh, and I think some people just 
don't want to get the message. Yeah. <laughs> it's easier just to be comfortable in their little box and, and not have to, to face the truth. And speaking of which, that's another part of the resistance from people, I think, against psychedelics. Because that is going to expose a truth that you can't ignore, that may cause you to have to make a shift. It seems like that's generally a theme, where people get comfortable in their ways. And this fear of change can prevent them from doing what's in their best interest, and globally in the best interest of, of the planet. But so going into that, you, you know, did an amazing job exposing kind of what's going on in the landscape and then decided to um, go down to the jungle. Tell us about that. Like what made <laughs> you decide to go drink this crazy psychedelic brew out in the, out in the rainforest? I, I'd spent 10 years covering violence and conflict and uh, seeing the worst of humanity, the worst side. Just, it was just almost like 10 years of my life were just under this dark cloud as a journalist. Uh, I was just always attracted to really shining light on the dark and really uh, focusing on the underbelly of society and murders and violence and, and fighting. And um, I think I had just absorbed so much of that dark energy over the years because as a journalist, in order to do my job, I felt like I really needed to kind of be, not become the story per se, but really absorb the pain of people I was interviewing to understand the story. Mm -hmm. And I just hit a point where I just, my stress level got so high that I wasn't sleeping. As a writer, I couldn't write. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I couldn't even you sit down. You were full. <laughs> I was full. Were just, <laughs> yeah. I'm full. Time to empty out. And I, I had constant butterflies in my stomach. I just had uh, symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. And I knew I didn't want to reach for a prescription drug to try to treat the symptoms I needed to get to the core. And so I'd gone on Joe Rogan's wait, show. Wait, wait, wait. You didn't want to just treat the symptoms? You wanted to stop the problem? <laughs> yeah, some crazy talk. <laughs> you know, I, I just can't. I did too many stories on people who have just treated the symptoms and then yeah. they've become addicted to drugs, uh, various legal prescription drugs. And, and I sure. just knew I didn't want to take that route. And, um, and so Joe Rogan had introduced me to psychedelics in October and I'd done a lot of research on them. And I remember reading one article on a woman who had uh, depression who went down and tried ayahuasca and she said after one session it was like 30 years of therapy in one night mm -hmm. and, uh, and she, she actually wrote for National Geographic it was a really powerful article and so in the back of my mind I just knew like when I couldn't take it anymore I was gonna get on a plane and go and I bought my ticket and then went down two days later completely unprepared mentally <laughs> physically <laughs> I was packing in my car <laughs> in the yeah. airport parking lot um, and just finding anything I could because I, I just was so out of it I didn't have time to really pack and I yeah. just got on the plane and the medicine was calling me and I just knew that I needed to be down there and that ayahuasca could help heal me. Mm -hmm. And so that I mean that's an incredibly bold step and I think it came from so many people are locked in this just accept the main story you know even people who I have direct contact with will who are on tons of you know, prescription medications, they can't break that fear of not doing what their doctor says. You know, it's like they get these fears deep inside and then it's just one, one prescription leads to these side effects that they take another prescription for and it's this, this vicious circle that puts a lot of money in the till but eventually erodes, you know, the sanctity of their own consciousness and self and health. Um, so I think, you know, Getting that paradigm is, is the first step, you know, kind of understanding, all right, we got to treat the organism as a whole, find out the source, do what is best for the, you know, for the whole being, you know, mind, body, spirit. And then taking the leap to drink this rich, murky mud brew from the jungle, <laughs> that's another, uh, that's another, another leap. But, you know, obviously, you, you know, you found that you heard a story about someone that, that was successful in doing that. And I think those stories are so prevalent now. You know, that's another piece of the puzzle that's kind of coming together. You don't have to go far. Almost everybody who I speak to has heard of ayahuasca and heard about somebody who it's changed their life for the better. So I think we're starting to get that. So, um, you know, that's kind of brought you to there. And then you became one of the ones that actually did it. So tell us about, you know, that first session how you were feeling as, as you went through. Because a lot of people here, even listening to my podcast, have yet to take that kind of plunge. And yeah. I think 
for me, and maybe even for you now, you know, really remembering back to that first session, you know, is interesting because now we were so, we've been there so many times, it's easy to forget the nerves and forget the courage that it took to grab that yeah. first cup. I can Sam. never forget that. Aubrey. <laughs> <laughs> I was a mess. I was so nervous and I, I was the only woman and there were um, 12 guys and me and I had to go up and drink first and I had no idea what psychedelics were about. The most mind-altering uh, state I've ever been in was smoking marijuana or, or having you know too much to drink and so I just had no idea what to expect but I knew I had no choice. Mm -hmm. I was like, I either do this or I don't get better. Yeah. And so, um, so I went up just thinking to myself, just forget the nerves. You need this. You need this healing. You have no choice. And I went up and asked for a full cup, which was the most amount you could take. And I remember looking around the circle at all the guys and they're like, darn, <laughs> like if she takes a full cup now, we have to all take one so, too. So he actually let you ask for how much you were going to get. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. He I have Usually the shamans that I've worked with, they just kind of look you over and pour the amount that they think you should get and you just drink it. So he probably would have given me a full cup anyway. Like, <laughs> but you were like, I'm mess. just going to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> Give it to me. Yeah. And I, I put it to my lips and I, before uh, I drank it, I set my intention and I just begged the ayahuasca for healing mm -hmm. and, um, and to really help me get to the core of what was wrong and just to cleanse my body, to cleanse my soul. And then I took a deep breath and I chugged it down and it tasted like stale coffee mixed with cough syrup. It was the most disgusting. I still remember, yeah. I still get the gag reflex <laughs> when I think about it. It almost gets worse <laughs> oh. when you drink it. Yeah. You know, it's this combination of fire and mud and yeah, it's intense. By, by the seventh time when I was there, I did seven ceremonies, I couldn't even hold it down I would throw up within five minutes of uh -huh. drinking it you know um, but then I, I just drank the full cup and I went back and I sat down on my mat next to my trusty bucket <laughs> and then uh, everyone went up one by one to drink and then all of a sudden I remembered I started feeling it after like 10 minutes I started feeling a little that's fast yeah it was quick because I think it knew it had a lot of work to do <laughs> so we better get started right yeah. away no time to waste yeah and I just started getting so <laughs> nervous like to the point where you feel like you're going to pass out because you're just like what is happening to me where am I going to go yeah and uh and I and it was to the point I couldn't sit up anymore everyone was still sitting up so I laid back I took my blanket and put it up to my neck <laughs> you know and just uh -huh tried to hide under the blanket <laughs> and I looked up at the uh, the ceiling which was a bunch of just wooden beams sure. and then all of a sudden the crickets started getting louder and louder the sounds of the forest and then the beams started shaking and um, and I remember hearing a voice that just said here we go <laughs> and, and then BAM I just was um, just flooded by numbers that were all across like zeros and ones and all this sacred geometry and beautiful colors and I flew down a timeline of my life and I saw photos of myself pop up at each age. It was like the medicine was trying to get to know me. Mm -hmm. And then it ended on a photo of me uh, being born and then a photo of my parents when they were young conceiving me. And then um, after that, uh, I went through just various like really stressful points of my life and had memories come up that I'd forgotten about and just reprocessed them. Mm -hmm. And then I was... Uh, at one point I was met by this like fairy like being who just was right in front of my face and and I remember not just feeling a sense of calm and then I felt that being um, like just slowly sucking things right. out of me and one by one these dark energy started coming out of my body in the shapes of people who I'd interviewed over the years like in the shapes of their faces who I guess I'd been absorbing all this dark energy and pain from them and it just started coming out one by one by one and then um, I woke up the next morning um, feeling just like like a new person yeah, and I was I so imagine. profoundly changed and just so my mind was so blown that I, I knew right then the minute I was like sober and woken up that this is what I wanted to focus on the rest of my life because I was like there's nothing that can compare with this yeah. <laughs> you know there's no amount of therapy that I could be given I could sit in, in a therapist's office for 
spend thousands and thousands sure. of dollars for years and they would never be able to heal me like or the get ayahuasca worse. did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you never know. It's a crapshoot with the therapist almost half the time. That's a, that's a really powerful story. And I think I've never had my, I, I've had a lot of experiences of things pulling dark energy out, mm. but never another kind of actual human-esque figure that's, uh, that's been able to do that. And uh, that must have been incredibly powerful. I had it as like a flotilla of snakes and uh-huh. feathers and this thing kind of stopped over me and started sucking all this black energy out. And then this other yeah. ship came in and started pouring different light inside my, wow. inside my body as well. And um, it was, I've had a lot of those type of experiences, but the actual seeing the pictures come out must have been incredibly, incredibly intense. Yeah, and it was uh, because at this point I didn't really know what was wrong with me because I was just so anxious. I, I just had thought maybe it was this one incident or, or this one close call I'd had in my career. I didn't realize it was a culmination of everything mm-hmm. because I couldn't remember specific events of my life because they'd been kind of repressed in my subconscious because I'd had so much trauma. And, um, and so for that actual movement of, of the being sucking these uh, spirits out of me really showed me uh, that that's what I needed to do to heal. And it showed yeah. me that I had been absorbing this pain because I didn't even know I was doing that. And then at one point during the ceremony too, the ayahuasca wrote on this brick wall like anxiety really really big <laughs> just like listen girl this is what's wrong with you we've diagnosed you know <laughs> and, and in actually, case you were wondering yeah. <laughs> this is what's wrong because i still didn't even really know what was wrong because you're in that state you just can't you almost you need a diagnosis and yeah. i guess the ayahuasca knew that so it was like clearly saying honey this is what's wrong with you yeah and then i just felt it almost fizzing in my brain like a fizzing sensation as if you poured like some kind of soda water all over mm-hmm. your brain and just was that's like, the best that's when you know you're gonna have a really good session yeah it doesn't, ha- it doesn't happen every time that kind of i f- almost feel like it's like your brain gets peeled back yeah like someone just peeled back the layer of your brain and it's tickling from the oxygen that it's feeling or something like that. it was incredible and it was yeah. like the medicine was telling me like we're getting in here and don't worry we're gonna just kind of restructure a little bit here and a little bit here and and try to rebalance your brain chemically and, um, and that's what I genuinely felt from the medicine at that time. And now that I've done more scientific research, scientists have found that uh, long-term ayahuasca users actually have improved serotonergic systems. Mm-hmm. So after using it for a while, it can actually restructure that part of your brain and improve it. And that's what I felt like it was doing to me at and the time. You know, you never know what is actually causing that because it could be the ayahuasca is changing the thoughts and mm-hmm. the thoughts are changing the serotonergic production. You know, people think of these things is so disconnected, you know, like your thoughts and your neurochemistry. Well, your thoughts actually affect your neurochemistry. They affect your cortisol levels. They affect all Mm -hmm. these different things. So, you know, whether it's the ayahuasca affecting the actual neurochemistry or the ayahuasca affecting the thoughts, which then affects the neurochemistry, either way, I think the correlation is, you know, going to be undeniable. And so many people are carrying around such trauma and um, like I was doing and you're just holding it in your body and of course that's going to manifest itself as negative thoughts or uh, serotonin problems or weird pains around your body and we all need to really purge that trauma and unfortunately psychedelics have just been taken out of our society so we have very few ways to do it so I think it's manifesting in the form of anxiety especially depression I mean we're seeing ridiculous rates of depression and yeah. Western society and um, everything in society is pushing us farther away from that natural balance yeah. you know I mean it's all of the the way that our attention is being drawn to a million different things at once getting farther away from nature I mean I always thought that if you lived a life where you were barefoot on the earth kind of cruising around making arrowheads hunting and mm-hmm. you know maybe you wouldn't need ayahuasca at that point maybe it'd be a good experience <laughs> yeah. but if you're do living the lives that we live you know always on the time on the go dealing with tons of different people with different energies dealing with all the technological advancements that we have that are great but you have no way to really reground yourself and you can't do it by a long expanse of time just being grounded I think psychedelics are that way back. That's the tool that the earth has provided to help us get back in balance. Yeah, I agree. I think Mother Nature is fighting back one ayahuasca drinker at a time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Just changing our, our negative epigenetics, removing trauma from 
you know, the entire population, just one person at a time, uh, to, to try to really heal all of this illness. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of us too have, because we're not able to use psychedelics at a young age, uh, the majority of the population, I, I think a lot of people are living lives not as their true selves, and they've just developed these personalities sure. to cope with society. And, and so ultimately, if you're not living your true life and your true self and you're stuck into some nine to five job that you hate where you're looking at the clock all day long and, and really just living, kind of just getting by day by day, not following your passions, then of course that's going to make you also have, have illness and, mm -hmm. and carry trauma. And I think these medicines can help people get more in touch with their true mission on earth. It's one of the most important things that it can do, you know, mm -hmm. I think is to show you, A, your authentic self. And once you understand your authentic self, then you can find your authentic path. But there's so many, I think, you know, Robert Greene calls them counterforces. You know, I mean, everything in society is going to try and push you to adapt to, you know, what the Toltecs call the metote, the dream of the world, or the other person's dream. It's very difficult to, you know, really chart your authentic, your authentic path. And... To do that, you have to know who you are at the very deepest core level. And, you know, deep meditation practices, float tanks, and psychedelics. I actually consider float tanks a type of psychedelic. Anyways, it's just a non, you know, or, you know something you don't consume, but that can really help you get there. It's one of the only ways that I know to actually find that, because it only, you can only find it in the stillness, you know, mm -hmm. in the deepest, quietest stillness. And that's what these medicines can provide. And something that the mushrooms showed me uh, was that I had developed personality throughout life that wasn't the true me, mm -hmm. per se, um, just to cope with society. I, I had this one vision of when I was eight years old, a memory I had completely forgotten, and I was dropped off uh, to go to school. And on the way into school, it was raining out. So I was playing in the rain, and I went down into the puddle, and I poured the water on my hair, because I was eight, you know? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and, um, and then when I got into class, I, I remember... Um, through the mushrooms, it showed me this memory of like the teachers yelling at me. They brought me to the nurse's office and were like checking me for the fever and, you know, <laughs> rinsing all the dirt off. How dare you put the water from the earth on yeah. your body, you know? And so crazy. And Aubrey, it was crazy because I, I never played in a puddle again after that. And it was so profound. I realized how many times throughout, because I'd always get in trouble in school. I'd always get my name written on the board. Anytime I tried to be the real me, which was very talkative and friendly, I'd get yelled at. Mm -hmm. And so I had to actually kind of close off my real personality and become this more um, stoic being that I really wasn't. And, and that had caused me a lot of anxiety because I wasn't living to be my true right. self. And so um, that's another really profound insight I had uh, while on psychedelics that I think a lot of people would have as well. There's been kind of a turning away in general from humanity against you know, Mother Nature, almost, mm -hmm. which is kind of really odd. It's like this, you know, not only are we destroying it with our environmental practices, but this almost innate fear of the natural aspects of it. You know, I mean, it's, it's funny hearing that story, of course, just, it's so wild to think <laughs> yeah. that this water pours from the sky, and if a kid comes and plays with it, it's going to cause a problem. Like, do you think if that caused problems that humans would exist? I know. You know, if the water from the sky was dangerous when it collected in pools. You know, I was pretty just, much told nature was dirty, but, yeah. you know, the pizza and taco salads yeah, they're eating sure. in the cafeteria were okay. Eat and, some more fluoride pills, yeah, dude. That'll yeah. help your teeth, but don't play in the puddles. <laughs> you know, stay away from that. It, and it's, so, it's just so sad because so many people have just been um, misdirected and we have lost our, our touch with nature for sure. I don't know if you're familiar with, um, and I think these are necessary. Some people have written me and said they are necessary in Canada <laughs> and other places where it's cold, but they have these mats where mm -hmm. you like connect the wire. Mats, yeah. yeah, earthing mats. And I just thought that was so profound. It's like, wow, we've really, not to say there's anything wrong with them. Like I think they truly are powerful, but we've so lost our connection with the earth that, you know, in order for people to have more of a connection, they have to buy mats. Or <laughs> right. some people will go for months without their feet actually touching the grass, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. It's just really, I mean, we've just completely had this, we've turned nature into concrete jungles and, and we're separated by, you know, the rubber on our shoes from even touching the ground. 
And I think we really need to go back and connect with that energy because within that energy, we also find the insights for healing. I think that's one of the reasons why people like the beach so much and don't even realize it. Because mm-hmm. finally, for once, they take their damn shoes off. Yeah. Just, and not because they want to, just because the sand's going to get in there. So yeah. it's like the, the one thing that can get them to actually lay on the earth, you know, get reconnected with that energy. Obviously, the water and the waves mm-hmm. have a, you know, kind of a power to it as well. But it's, you don't meet people who, if you meet someone, it's like, yeah, I fucking hate the beach. <laughs> just, yeah. just go the other way. Just get out of there. Sounds that like person, someone that hates dogs. Yeah. I always go the other way. <laughs> like, you don't want any parts of that human. Yeah. You know, they need to go directly nonstop to mm-hmm. Quitos and figure some shit out. Yeah. <laughs> if you hate the beach. But I think that's one of the things that's happening that people don't even mm-hmm. recognize. And one of the reasons why I like to stay out here in Southern California is, you know, head straight out to the water, take a long walk on the beach and that's medicine in itself, you know, and so many, so much of these things that are handled by pills and different things could be handled by such simple things, you know, a long walk on the beach, some good, healthy, you know, earth grown nutrient based food. And I bet a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that people are suffering from would start to ease. And then of course there's the truly powerful, powerful medicines for the deeper illnesses that you have to deal with. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and I, I mean, I think more than anything, psychedelics have really, they've turned my life right side up and they've also made me believe in the power of nature to have something to cure every one of our ailments. And that I, growing up in the Midwest, A, I was fed a ton of propaganda about psychedelics, how MDMA eats holes in your brain right. and shrooms will cause you to go crazy. Everybody on earth read that study about yeah. MD, or got, that got proliferated. And it wasn't even MDMA. It was methamphetamines in the study. And then they retracted like five years later. Oh, sorry. That study was on methamphetamines. And but Oprah, too, she aired that, uh, she showed a diagram of a brain where it looked like the MDMA had cut holes inside the brain like Swiss cheese and I still remember my grandma taping that bringing it over to my house and making me and my sister sit down and watch it and it turned out that that was just mapping cerebral uh, blood flow so it had nothing to do with holes in the brain and the MDMA wasn't proving to be neurotoxic yeah but Oprah never went back and corrected that yeah and the damage had been done by then the whole country thought all psychedelics were we're going to, you know, kill you. <laughs> do you think that is, do you think when you look at how, you know, psychedelics have been, you know, made illegal and all these things, do you, do you see this kind of nefarious, sinister conspiracy to, to make these illegal? Or do you think it's just people's innate fears of these things for themselves that are playing out on a larger scale? I mean, it's hard to know for sure, but what's your kind of general inclination and thought on it? I think psychedelics scare those in power because they tend to lead to detribalization, which is the dissolving of borders. Eventually you start to realize that you're not black, you're not white, you're not Asian, you're just human, you're not American, mm-hmm. you're not uh, you know, African, you're just a human. And so you start to dissolve all these false borders that have been put up to make you fear your neighbors or make you just not feel connected. So I think that, and then also, I think there's a little bit of the prescription drug industry Mm -hmm. because where they're scared of marijuana and they fall back against marijuana, they're terrified of psychedelics because even marijuana tends to kind of just be a way to placate symptoms but not really cure what's wrong, whereas psychedelics tend to really get to the root of whatever's wrong. Yeah, marijuana replaces a few things, but psychedelics replace a lot of things. Yeah. And that's a, it's billions of dollars that the industry stands to lose because they can't patent these natural substances. And so I think there's a little bit of of that play. I think when these studies came out, when they were doing really active studies uh, on psilocybin, on LSD for alcoholism, they had 45% success rate. AA, there was a study shown that they don't even have a study that actually can reliably show how successful AA is. Mm -hmm. And then LSD had 45% cure rate. So all of these studies had come out in the 60s and the 70s really showing that, whoa, <laughs> yeah. if we put psychedelics out there, it, they're going to cure all of these illnesses that we're just treating with pills. And mm-hmm. I, so I think that that was in the mix as well. And then um, and I think above all, too, you're hitting the nail on the head that people are just scared to go there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they don't even want that temptation uh, because there's a lot of egos out there. We've been taken over by egos and uh, therefore is making people go insane. And, you know, I think the core root of 
all of the problems happening on Earth, especially when it comes to environmental destruction, is just this madness. And, um, and I think psychedelics can really get in there and cure this madness. I see them as potentially being one of the main salvations for humanity. Yeah, no doubt. I think that, you know, you, when you look at where, where we are now, I mean, you, you can see kind of trends that have developed. And, you know, I think you have to follow back from certain, you know, religious oppression certainly had a, had a, had a factor in certain ways that different landscapes and different populations were steered and the guilt that they kind of brought in about being a human and being, you know, being one with nature and, and kind of made that shameful and made that guilty. And you see trends like that. And then you see the other trends of following, um, you know, these kind of big corporate conglomerates who have done things to manipulative for, for money's sake. And you start to see these trends and it's all about just organizations that have utilized their lust for power in order to manipulate large amounts, bodies of people. Mm. And we're seeing this result. And psychedelics are potentially the unwinding of that. And so all of these other forces at play are, you know, going to be, going to make a stand against it. But encouragingly, it's ultimately the truth will, I think, win and reveal mm. itself. It's just kind of a race now to see what this final last gasp of these entities and organizations and forces at large that have yeah. been adopted by, by people. It's no longer not even just the force, like some governing body at, at the very tip. It's people have assimilated this into their own story. You know, so it's this giant iceberg that needs to kind of shift. But I think, you know, I see some encouraging signs of it happening. Let's just hope it happens sooner than, yeah. than later, I think is the key. I hope psychedelics can ride the wave of the marijuana movement. Mm -hmm. It seems promising. I'm hoping they don't just become the forgotten <laughs> yeah. amazing substances. Uh, but I, I think that it's really encouraging that uh, the Supreme Court said that the Santo Dame Church could continue to use ayahuasca based on their Religious Freedom Restoration Act, so that's positive. Peyote, a lot of people don't know, is legal in six states in the United States. So you go to Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, I don't know all the rest, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. you can access that. And so I think that it's coming, but slowly, but I, I do think we're on a path to eventually have total legalization of all drugs in this country, especially if you have all this money from George Soros and the like, <laughs> really pumping into this sure. idea. I'm hoping that that's, that's where we go. I think we need to be able to have, you can't have freedom or live in the land of the free when you can't even have the freedom to decide your own consciousness. Yeah, the freedom over the sovereignty of your own consciousness. What is more sacred than that? I think Graham Hancock does some of the best job of describing that mm -hmm. incredible thing that we bought into where we allow some governing body to tell us what to do with our own minds. I mean, it's incredible that we've gotten to that state. But for those people who, you know, you, I get a lot of questions about how to do it, and I always recommend doing it in the legal setting just because I couldn't you know, recommend people to take unnecessary risk, although, you know, I think we've all <laughs> done that ourselves and been in those situations. But you were telling a story of a, a legal way to do mushrooms. It sounded like like a little mini paradise yeah. out, in, uh, out in Indonesia. So tell us about this place in Indonesia where if someone wanted to get a really beautiful, relaxing, and eye-opening experience they could go. Yeah, there's this little island called uh, Gili Island, and there they have mushrooms. It's nicknamed Mushroom Island, and so... It's um, always a good sign yeah. when you're going <laughs> an island named Mushroom Island. And everywhere you go around there, there's just mu plentiful mushrooms. You can order them on a pizza and a shake, and technically, I mean, the laws are ambiguous. It's just not really enforced. Uh, mm the mushroom use and so it's sold openly so I think that's enough of an invitation for those who are in dire need of the mushrooms yeah. <laughs> to go there and be able to access them um, but once again the law is ambiguous however this entire island is just filled sure. with everyone cooking up mushroom shakes so uh, and it's just beautiful you can sit on the beach for days and just drink one shake after the other <laughs> and, <laughs> and just know peacefully in your mind that you're actually helping to rebuild brain cells because some studies have shown that uh, psilocybin can lead to neurogenesis and which is a regrowth of brain cells 
So you can just be there happily tripping and, and regrowing brain cells and enjoying it's, life and re-energizing your soul. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's so, it's so funny to, you know, everybody's been told the lie that doing drugs is going to kill brain cells, you know? And it's actually, literally, when you look at the science, doing the exact opposite. You know, regrowing. Here you are, <laughs> you know, oh, you're going to kill all your brain cells doing those hallucinogens and blah, or the opposite. You know, like, <laughs> or the complete opposite of what you think, but okay. If know. that doesn't tell you how ridiculous the war yeah. on drugs is, I don't know what does. Because mushrooms are still Schedule One, so that means they have no medicinal value. But studies since the 1950s have shown that they reduce anxiety, that they can be used medicinally. Uh, they actually say, Schedule One says that it has a high chance to be addictive. Whereas mushrooms are proven, you cannot get addicted to mushrooms. Like your body cannot become dependent on them. In fact, the more you take, the less you actually feel them. So they're self-regulating. Yeah. And the caffeine in your coffee is more toxic on your body than psilocybin mushrooms. So <laughs> it, it's just so backwards. And, yeah. and after you start to do the research, all you have to do is Google psilocybin, anxiety, depression, addiction. And you'll see all these amazing studies that have shown how healing these substances are. But once again, I think that's why the industry fe fears them is because they get to the core. And instead of just putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound, they actually pull out that trauma and, and cure you so you don't need mushrooms anymore, which yeah. is how a medicine should behave. I would really like someone to put the credible argument that a boga has a high chance for recreational <laughs> use and addiction. Yeah. Like, really? All right, you're going to go through 24 hours of pure hell where you feel yeah. like you're in a high voltage shed and you're puking and sometimes a thousand pound pancake is on you, but your mind is going to be incredibly lucid and clear. And you're going to tell me that that has a high, high chance for addiction? Really? Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's just... <laughs> Lots of people are going to just be signing up for that 24 hours of hell. You know, I mean, it's, it's so, it's such madness. It's just all about control, too. And, you know, I saw something really interesting the other day. I mean, we, we are completely distorted when it comes to re rehabilitation and rehab. And a lot of rehabs have maybe 3% success rate, especially when kicking heroin, mm -hmm. whereas... Ibogaine, I think it's somewhere around 90%. Yeah, yeah. It's really unbelievable. And that I think was it's the, just... That was the center that I went to. They had, you know, internally in their records, you know, over a 90% success rate. Wow. And there's other, there's other duplicates of that that you can find in different clinics in Mexico, different clinics everywhere. It's somewhere in that 90% range. And then without it, very low, you mm -hmm. know, 20s, 30s, if they're lucky. It's unbelievable to know how many people are suffering. I think it's criminal not to sure. offer these. To and then the even population. in those people who are cured of their heroin addiction in that 20, 30%, then they're addicted to, you know, Suboxone and Methadone and these other things, which are also highly toxic and highly addictive. Yeah. So you're just trading one for the other. That was one of my last stories at CNN was on babies actually being born addicted to prescription painkillers because their mothers are addicted and their mothers can't quit because the baby might die in utero from withdrawal. And so the mothers have to continue taking um, the oxycodone or whatever mm -hmm. painkiller they're on. And then the baby's born and then the baby goes into withdrawal almost immediately, like a person would on heroin. And I remember seeing that just thinking like, what the hell <laughs> has happened to this country? Like you either laugh or you start crying when you see people building NICUs that are double in size just to yeah. deal with all these prescription drug addicted babies. And you really realize at that point, I mean, I always wondered in my career why all these insanely depressing stories came my way and I think it was all to lead to this journey to psychedelics because instantly after my first drink of ayahuasca I knew how powerful psychedelics would be for the entire country because I'd seen all the suffering and I saw that the ayahuasca, that these mushrooms, that the ibogaine could really cure that suffering. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I do think it's one of the greatest human rights tragedies of this century yep. that people don't have access to these medicines and so many people are just suffering and and the cure is right there you know and um not for all but for most yeah i mean it's uh you you obviously have you know you don't want to tout this as a panacea you know mm -hmm. something i'll oh, just take it and you'll be fine because i think a lot of it has to do with your intent and a lot of it has to do with the setting and a lot of it has to do with how you're doing it but i, I don't really know anybody who couldn't in the right with the right mindset benefit from it. I think it's something that in a healthy society it would be 
you know, just part of the fabric of, of living. You know, finding someone who didn't take psychedelics would be as uncommon as finding someone who'd never had a beer mm-hmm. or a wine, you know, and being in Europe. You know, like that would be, it would just be one of those things that wouldn't be this big thing like, oh, have you, have you tried this? It'd be like, of course, you know, it's part of our rites of passage. It's part of what we're taught in schools. It's mm-hmm. part, it's just integrated into the fabric of life. And I think ultimately that was the way that things should have developed like they were in some of the other indigenous cultures with the use of this. You know, everybody kind of, you know, some people do it only a couple times in their life, but everybody in the tribe, everybody in society had the experience with the medicine and could decide when they wanted to do more or less and everybody just kind of figures it out. But we're so far from that I now. Know. But it's, it's creeping up, you know, I mean, more and more people. Ayahuasca was not a household name, you know, five, ten years ago. Mm-hmm. It is now, you know, everybody's kind of heard. And I think the awareness is that first key. And I think the project that you're embarking on is going to be another huge assistance to that. So tell us a little bit about that project that, uh, that you started. Yeah, I had a, when I was on mushrooms one time, I had this vision of just a, a globe and just spreading like the tentacles of what I was learning, just spreading around the globe and, and spreading psychedelics. And it was just so powerful that I, even now, just if I close my eyes, I, I see it right away. And um, at the time I was starting an investigative news site. And the psychedelics were telling me, honey, you got this all wrong. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know? You're spending your whole life just shining lights on the dark. You need yeah. to shine a light on the light. Otherwise, it's never going to work. Humanity's been fighting and there's been chaos since the dawn of humanity. Mm-hmm. If you only focus on that, how are you going to help people come out of the darkness? You need to show them the light. And that was psychedelics. And so I'm starting this website called Reset.me. And so anyone who needs to hit the reset button in life, or just wants a, a change in their consciousness, or is facing an addiction, depression, anxiety, we encourage them to go there to find accurate journalism on these substances. And we'll also have forums where people can share secrets and uh, you know let people know reliable centers they went to. You can ask others for advice, um, as well as areas on the site where people can share news articles and studies. And really, we're just building the foundation of a community where people can come and talk about psychedelics openly and freely and not just psychedelics also alternative medicines and therapies and the whole goal ultimately with the site is to really just empower people to take their health into their own hands and say that you know you are in charge when it comes mm-hmm. down to it and you don't need a doctor you don't necessarily need western medicine if that's failed you have the power in your own hands to heal yourself yeah. And and so that's what we want to do with this site is give people the power to hit that reset button. And Terrence McKenna, when he was describing psychedelics, he compared them to hitting the reset button on your brain and clearing out your hard drive and kind of starting over uh, from point zero as your true self, your true soul without this fake personality and all of the uh, you know bruises of society on your, on your life. Yeah. And so I'm really hoping that this will be able to bridge the gap between these medicines and more of a mainstream audience. I think it'll certainly, you know, certainly be a huge blow in in the favor. And so I'm really looking forward to that. And I think, uh, I think we all are as well. You know, I I think the the concept of the reset is, is right on the money. And I've often felt that as well. If you think of yourself as a program running in these disparate frequencies and different Mm -hmm. things going, I've often felt that particularly you know, the strongest one for me has been the aboga because it has a kind of really, a really strong frequency itself, but it feels like you're an ant on a giant tuning fork. And then all of a sudden you just crash it against, you know, (laughs) flash it against the earth and spread, and it's so strong that everything else that's out of whack just starts vibrating to that frequency and you can start over. And then your truest authentic frequency can start to exist because all the other programs that are running you know, you just get to defrag and start over. So that's, uh, where can people find you? Um, besides, I know reset.me is going to be the hub, um, mm-hmm. anywhere else they can kind of reach out to you and, uh, and stay up with, with what you're doing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, on, uh, amberlinelive.com. That's kind of my personal website where I just keep people updated on projects and also on Twitter at amberlion, L Y O N. And then I'm starting uh, a podcast slash web TV show 
all about this, just encouraging people to take healing into their own hands and letting people know that you really are in control of your destiny. And um, that's going to be called Reset with Amber Lyon, and that should launch toward the end of the month as well. Beautiful. So, yeah, a that's lot of awesome. stuff on the go, but <laughs> super exciting. And yeah. for me, journalistically, it's just so exciting to be able to focus on solutions and give people, try to give people more power through our journalism. That's awesome. Well, thank you for stopping by this humble little show here, and uh, it's been awesome to connect with you, and I'm looking forward to a uh, you know, lifetime of uh, a partnership and spreading the light. For sure. Thank you so much. Absolutely.